put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise, a sound that resonates, that all of heaven and earth may worship you. We tread the hills to meet with you, to see your majesty in all that surrounds us. For it speaks and displays the eternal God of ages, creator, author, victor. In love, you established an everlasting covenant with your people, and it's your love that captivates us. As children of the King, we rush in as waves unrestrained, overcome, overwhelmed, that the King crowned in glory and splendor would reach down to place a crown upon our heads. So we raise our banner, the banner we boldly stand under, the banner of Jesus Christ. From dusk to dawn, from age to age, your praise runs in all the earth. Deliverer, Redeemer, ruler of an everlasting kingdom that cannot be shaken. We trust in the name of Christ Jesus, the only King forever. Yeah, hallelujah this morning, church. Welcome to Vertical Life Church. Uh, we just have a few announcements for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dave to open us in prayer. A couple of things I want to call your attention to. Uh, again, our, the next meeting for our prayer night is going to begin September 13th. It's where we gather in uh, uh, our home, and we just pray. We pray what God has laid on our heart, but we also intercede for our city, our country, and the world. And so we want to encourage you to mark your calendars and plan on joining with us September 13th. Uh, for those of you watching online, uh, you can continue to give at www.blchurch.tv forward slash give. Or uh, for those of gathering here in person today, we do have the green bucket in the back. We appreciate everyone that's giving and supporting the ministry of Vertical Life Church. Last week, we just celebrated and dedicated the new property that we purchased as we look forward to uh, the, the building that we're going to be uh, moving into, preferably in the near future. So continue to pray for that process, the raising of funds, the planning, that uh, we would have wisdom on how to move forward there. Um, also, coming up October the 8th, we're beginning uh, the new Life Group series. Uh, we're calling it Foundations. It's uh, V-Life Foundations. Anything or anyone aspiring to be a leader or to grow in your relationship with Christ, this is a... Uh, life group, a study, a nine-week study that you're going to want to be a part of. And so we want to encourage you to not only mark your calendar beginning Thursday, October 8th, but also register. And there's a sign-up sheet at the VIP table, or should be. If not, we'll get it and make sure it's there because it's here somewhere floating around. But um, there's a registration sheet at the VIP table. You want to register so we can get a count of how many to expect. As well, one of the celebrate celebrations and highlights of every year is a Baptism Sunday. And I know over the course of this year, several have made decisions to follow Christ or renew their relationship with Jesus. Jesus said to all who would follow him and believe that you should be baptized. That's the way we publicly profess our relationship with God, that we are a child of God. So if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, but you've not yet publicly been baptized to tell the whole world that you belong to Christ, to prepare you for that Spirit-filled life, we want you to register on the sign-up sheet of the VIP table so we can get a count of how many are wanting to participate and we can begin planning for that special day. We want to plan that before the end of the summer so we're not baptizing you in ice. So, because uh, we, we don't have our own space, so it's either in my backyard or in a lake somewhere. You get to decide how warm that water is. So uh, definitely sign up as soon as possible so we can get that planned up. And I know that's going to be a great time. It's always a highlight of our ministries. We celebrate what God is doing in the lives of all the people that gather with us. So at this time, we're going to ask Dave to come and open us in prayer. And then we're going to enter a time of worshiping our Lord this morning. Good morning. Our job right now is to get super excited and get filled with the Spirit. So, good morning. Woo! All right. God is good, right? Amen. Amen. All right. How about the people in the back? Good morning. <laughs> All right. We have a lot of new faces. You know, we had breakfast at our table for the first time in weeks today. And uh, one, of the, one of the prayers that our daughter prayed was that we were going to see a miracle today, that somebody was going to get up Amen. and walk or something amazing was going to happen. And I really feel like there's going to be a miracle today that's going to take over. Yes. Amen? 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 Amen. All right. 
So uh, today we're going to invite ourselves to be filled with the Spirit. We're going to allow the Spirit to come into this place. We're going to surrender our, our bodies. We're going to surrender our souls. And we're going to allow the Spirit to align straight with God so that we can focus directly on all the good stuff that he has for us. Amen. Lord, we just, uh, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the heat. We thank you for absolutely every blessing that you continue to pour into our lives. Lord, we thank you for even those times where there's rain. And uh, we know that's important for growth, Lord. Right now, with all the things that are going on inside of our life, all the problems, the chaos, the waves, everything that seems like it can take our eyes off you, Lord, we surrender that to you right now. Because right now, Lord, this is the time that we are dedicating to serve you, to worship you, to glorify you, to edify your kingdom. Lord, right now we lift you up. We glorify you and we thank you, Lord. May you just continue to be gracious to us. We continue to just be patient. Show us your kindness and your love. Right now, Lord, we just lift our arms up and we invite the Holy Spirit in. That is our our spirit that is headed by your kingdom today. Just thank you, Jesus. Better than you, there's nothing. Cause 
unsearchable one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts and i will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works and men shall speak of thy might and of thy terrible acts and i will declare thy greatness they shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness the lord is gracious full of compassion slow to anger and great mercy the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of thy glory and of thy kingdom, talk of thy power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy dominion endure throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up those that be bowed down. The eyes of all that wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him, and to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth them and love him. All the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Come on.
Thank you for the testimony, your faithfulness, your promises, your goodness, your word. All of your mighty acts, God. Every miracle you've performed, every miracle you have yet to perform. God, may we always testify of the greatness of who you are. Oh 
think this next song is especially appropriate for our day because I've talked to many Christians that are feeling really overwhelmed right now. And they're scared and they're worried and they don't know what's coming next. And I know we keep saying it, but that's because our hearts need that reminder over and over. God's not surprised. He's not shocked. He's still in control. He's still sovereign. He's still good. And he's still going to bring amazing things out of everything that's happening. He always makes good things out of chaos, out of tragedy, out of everything that the enemy means for evil. He turns it around and makes something good. And that's one of the many reasons that we can praise him today with confidence and reassurance that he has us in his hand. He's never going to let us go. That he's still just. He's in control. He's still ruling. He's still reigning. So let's sing, God, I look to you. I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do.
situation that he reigns over whatever it is he still reigns he's reigning over that situation today he's not forgotten you he's not left you he's working in it he is lord of that situation today he is reigning he's in control he has a plan and guess what his plans never fail so we don't need to worry. We don't need to doubt him today. He never fails. Oh God, you reign, you reign. You are Lord over all. There's nothing that takes you by surprise. You're still Lord. Oh, you're King of kings. And your power is infinite. It never runs out for oh, your glory. We can't comprehend your glory. And you're still working everything for our good, for our good. And we trust you again. Yes, Lord, you reign over all creation. You reign over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. You reign over the sky above and the earth below. God, you reign before time and after the end. God, you reign and you are good. And we reaffirm our trust in you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for inhabiting the praises of your people and revealing your presence this morning. I pray, God, that you would rekindle that fire that you placed in us when we first met you, when we first encountered grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy. Just this revelation that we often need to go back and think back in the past to remember what was before. Not to become religious or become stale, but so that we don't forget not just what happened, but the emotion, the heart impact of when it occurred. There are songs, Lord, that we sing that instantly bring back emotion and memory because it was significant when that you first encountered us in those songs, Lord. And I just pray that every time we open up the word, every time the name of Jesus is declared, it would rekindle that passion because, God, you are worthy of it. In battle men surrender often when they're overwhelmed and when we surrender to the enemy we surrender to bondage to captivity to imprisonment but Lord when we surrender to you we surrender to freedom we surrender to life everlasting 
And when our hearts encounter that awakening, hallelujah. So awaken us this morning. Break off the rust and the dust that the world has been able to build up in our lives, God, and light that fire again. Because the call of freedom, the call of liberty, is sounding again in this nation. And it's the kingdom of God and the priests of God that are to lead the way. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated in this place. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm excited for today. I'm not going to be, I'm going to be brief here at the beginning because we're going to watch a video in just a minute that I think is not just a good refresher, but it's going to reveal some things that maybe you didn't even know about our great nation. But it's no surprise that there are things happening in our nation today, in and around the world, but really in our nation that are unlike any time ever in our nation's history. And this goes hand in hand with really where we are in the scriptures, in this story of the great romance. We're in Exodus chapter 1. Um, we're going to read a few, pa- a few scriptures here, and we'll watch the video, and I'll have a few comments after. But in Exodus chapter 1, verses 5 through 12, here's how this book begins It says, in all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. Remember that the nation of Israel, they, they, through Abraham, got to the promised land. They begin, uh, he began to have children and grandchildren, and they were settling in the land of Canaan. But a time came where famine hit the land, and Jacob and his sons had to uh, move into Egypt in order to survive. And he did that through a supernatural working through the life of Joseph, an incredible story. Joseph is elevated to the second in command of all of Egypt, and he single-handedly not only saves the nation, but also the surrounding countries and cultures during this great famine. So Jacob and all of his sons uh, went to Egypt, and including Joseph that was already there. Verse 6 says, In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly They became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from our country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of, the, of Python and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, the more alarmed the Egyptians became. This begins this miraculous story of God's salvation to Israel. But one thing I want to highlight today in our discussion today as the title of this message is simply called, When History is Forgotten. When History is Forgotten. How many of you, your favorite class in school was history? Can I have a show of hands? Yeah, so a few of you. Yeah, it was mine. I love history. Math, I could have done a, without math. I just, let's skip that. Um, Science, not a big science guy, but history, something has always drawn me to history. Here is the reality. When you forget your history, you open yourself up to very difficult times. You open yourself up. It's been said that if you don't remember the past, you'll be doomed to repeat it or something to that effect. There's something significant about history. Not knowing history is a detriment to to a society. And here in, e- in Egypt, a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph or anything he had done, who did not know this Hebrew who was a slave, who was a prisoner, who was then elevated to second in command, who was responsible for uh, delivering not just Israel, but Egypt and all the surrounding nations from the famine. He didn't know his history. And so because he didn't know his history, It was up to him to determine how he was going to interpret or perceive this group of people that now dwell in the land that seemed to be growing and growing in number and in power. And instead of being 
uh, just encouraged by their presence because it was because of Israel and the people that Egypt was saved, that Egypt became one of the strongest nations in recorded history. They began to fear Israel as if they were an enemy because they didn't know their history. They didn't know Joseph or what he had done. Not knowing history is a detriment to any society, especially a society that is built on the faith of Jesus Christ. I believe the breakdowns of our society today, you can't turn on the news without seeing chaos. You cannot do it today. You rarely have a story that brings joy and peace and encouragement. It's strife, it is division, it is drama, it is chaos. And I believe the breakdowns in our society today, and the reason why we have so much turmoil in the streets, unashamed immorality, gender and sexual confusion, broken families, and anarchy, why many Americans can't tell you why socialism is a bad idea or a terrible thing, it's a direct result of not knowing our history and where we've come from. We don't know why we should love our country. Rather, we're taught to hate it. Like Pharaoh in Egypt, since history's been forgotten, we have allowed others to inform us as a society how we should think about our history, our country, and the people within it. And now, the Christian and faith community and the principles that we hold dearly in the Word of God have become now the very enemy of culture rather than the leaders of culture because we've forgotten our history. So we're going to watch a video by a man named David Barton who's going to unveil what many of you probably have never heard about our nation. He's not just going to tell you about it. He has the evidence to back it up. Our world loves evidence when it backs up their point of view. But when evidence is presented that contradicts their point of view, they have a problem with it, which is why they don't tell you about it. But we're going to hear evidence about how our country came into being. And then I'm going to have a few thoughts after the video. Let's go ahead and roll that film. Thanks, sir. Let me start with where we are on Tuesday. Tuesday, we celebrate uh, the 4th of July. When we do that on Tuesday, we will set another world's record. Now, the Declaration of Independence under which we now govern ourselves, this Tuesday will be our 241st birthday. No nation in the history of the world has been under the same piece of paper for 241 years. Nowhere even close. That's a blessing we often take for granted. Oh, it's 4th of July again. Yeah, but it's the same nation having the 4th of July, and that doesn't happen often. Put that in perspective. 241 years we've had under the same piece of paper. Do you know how long the average constitution in the world lasts? Any clue? The average constitution in the world lasts 17 years. 241 we've got, I kind of like not having a revolution, not having a war every generation or so. We just kind of take that for granted. We just assume that that's... You know, in the same period of time, we've had our one piece of paper. France has gone through 15 constitutions. Venezuela's had 25. Haiti's had 21. If you live in Poland, you had seven constitutions in the 20th century. If you live in South Korea, you've had six constitutions since World War II. I mean, imagine living in nations with that kind of turnover. We don't even think about that. We just take it, we're so blessed with stability, we just assume that's natural. It's not. This is the exception. This is not the rule. The same when you look at things like our creativity. When you look every year, America has 4% of the world's population. Every year, our 4% of the world's population produces more patents, more copyrights, more medical cures, more technolog technological discoveries, more scientific findings. We produce more plays, more symphonies, more books, more literature, more art, more movies. Our 4% produces more than the 96% of the world every single year. 4% should produce 4% of the world's whatever. Our 4% produces more than 96 every single year. We are so surrounded by technology, we just assume this is normal in the world. It's not. What we have is not normal. We've been exceptionally blessed. And the same thing when you look at our prosperity. Our 4% of the world's population produces 25% of the world's gross domestic product. We are so rich that we don't even recognize how rich. Matter of fact, let's just take poverty for an issue. You take the issue of poverty, the World Bank is the one that sets the standard, the global standard of poverty. According to the World's Bank, if you live on a dollar and 25 cents a day, you live in poverty. Now, 
Half the world lives on a dollar and 25 cents a day or less. That half the world is in poverty. If you're in a developed industrial country like us and you live on $2 a day, that's what they consider poverty level. One fourth of the world lives on $2 a day. So that's the poverty level by the World Bank. You know what the poverty level is in America? We consider the poverty level right around $45,000, dollars The rest of the world is start struggling at $730 a year. Matter of fact, we have 80 anti-poverty programs in the U.S. government. Last year, we averaged spending $61,000 per poor family in America, and that's poverty. The rest of the world would love to come to America and live in poverty. If they could be in our poverty here, it would elevate their lifestyle. We don't understand the blessings we have in this place. We are, we are blessed in so many ways, and we have been for generations. Way back in 1831, a man named Alexis de Tocqueville came here from France, young Frenchman, came here. He saw America. He was amazed. He wrote about it. It's a book we call Democracy in America that we often study in school. And in that book, he said, America is exceptional. The condition there is unlike any in, in, in the world. And that's where we get the term American exceptionalism. Now, American exceptionalism, it, it's not a cocky, arrogant statement that we're better than everybody else. It's, it's a statement of fact. We are the exception, not the rule. Everybody else has a revolution every 17 years or so, not us. Everybody else is struggling economically, not us. When we struggle economically, we're still so far above everyone else. Everyone else is looking for technology. We've got it. I mean, we're, we're blessed in so many ways. And when you say, who's responsible for this? And by the way, I just tell you up front, I've been very blessed. I've been involved in several cases of the U.S. Supreme Court, involved in a lot of political stuff, involved particularly in history. We own 100,000 documents from before 1812. I own thousands, tens of thousands of, of documents. I own thousands of documents that George Washington and Ben Franklin. All these guys, we, we, we celebrate on the 4th of July, got that stuff, got black history, got constitutional history, church history thousands of it, and that's why in a number of states I've been appointed by governors and state boards of education to write the history and social studies standards from various states. So I know it's in history textbooks. And, and when we talk about American exceptionalism, invariably we would say now in the textbooks, kids, who are the leaders responsible for what we enjoy in America today? And when we ask that question, invariably, the textbooks will go to great political leaders, great historical figures. We'll, we'll go to, say, well, George Washington, and the father of his country. And you've got folks like Thomas Jefferson, and you've got John Hancock, and you've got John Adams. And that's great. These guys did a big thing. But the difference is they had a different set of names than what we have. And they were the eyewitnesses. They actually saw it. For example, in 1818, a young historian named Hezekiah Niles, he was kind of, he was a millennial of their day, if you will. He came to him and said, old man Adams, 42 years ago, you were involved in the American Revolution. We weren't there, but we sure enjoy what you guys have given us. Who's responsible for what we have? I'm writing a history book. Who's responsible for what we have today? And John Adams said, you want to know who's responsible for all the, the independence and things you enjoy today? Yeah, that's it. He said, well, he said, right up top, you got to put the Reverend Dr. Samuel Cooper. Who? Anybody studied that in your textbooks? Probably not. John Adams, who was there, said, hey, right at the top, he said, you also have to have the, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew, and don't forget the Reverend George Whitfield, and of course, the Reverend Charles John. He goes through and lists preachers. He said, these are the guys. There's no way we study preachers today in textbooks as being responsible for what we have in America, the exceptionalism we have. You know what? We don't study preachers, whether they're white, whether they're black. I mean, who in the world is Richard Allen or Absalom Jones or John Moran or Lemuel? We don't know these guys today. They're huge. As a matter of fact, he is back, one of the we, we really treat black history very bad today. Uh, basically, we think black history starts with MLK, with, with the Civil Rights Movement. No, you go back in the founding era with all the black founding fathers we never talk about. Do you know we had blacks elected office in 1768 in New Hampshire? They held a black went with Cheswell. Uh, he held office for 49 years, held eight different political positions. We had blacks elected office back then. There never was a time in the history of Massachusetts when blacks could not vote. When the U.S. Constitution was ratified in Baltimore, more blacks than votes were voted to ratify the U.S. Constitution. You got guys like Lemuel Haynes, the first black man to ever hold a higher degree of education in America. He was a soldier in the American Revolution. He founded churches all over America. First black black man to have a sermon preached. He was, as a soldier in the revolution, in his churches, uh, George Washington was his commander in chief, and his churches, every year on George Washington's birthday, he would have a special sermon on George Washington, his commander in chief, with whom he had served. We don't hear anything about those kind of guys, or Thomas Hercules, who served in office back in the founding era. We don't hear about Prince Sisson or Oliver Cromwell. We don't hear about Peter Salem. We don't hear about Prince Esterbrook. All the black founding fathers, we, we don't cover that. But back, back to this thing, why would John Adams point to so 
many preachers and say these are the guys responsible? Well, the answer is, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration opens with 161 words that set forth six principles of American government. Everything in the Constitution goes back to one of those six principles. Then they gave 27 grievances showing how that all those principles have been violated by Great Britain. Interestingly enough, what we know is that all of those rights set forth in the Declaration of Independence, every one of them had been preached from the American pulpit prior to 1763. You know what that means? That means the Declaration of Independence is a list of the sermons we were hearing for 20 years leading up to the American Revolution. Whoever reads the Declaration of Independence is a sermon topic list. But that's exactly what it was. You see, that's how America was founded back in the beginning. That's what the eyewitnesses told us, but that's not what we present today. And it's interesting, these are the guys we call our founding fathers. See, there's a 56 assigned the Declaration of Independence. The first time they ever got together was in 1774, the first provincial congress. In 1774, when they got together, these guys didn't know each other. I mean, John Adams didn't know the guys from Georgia, and the guys from Pennsylvania didn't know the, the guys over here from Delaware. I, they, they had no clue. I mean, the first time. They, so what do they do first time they get together? First thing they do is they open with prayer. Now, the prayer that they opened with was not a dinky little civic prayer, God bless this meeting. It was a two-hour prayer session they had to open the first Congress of the United States. And it didn't just stop there. According to John Adams, who was there, John Adams said that they also studied four chapters of the Bible that morning in Congress. About two hours, prayer, Bible study. And out of that Bible study, he said that God showed them things out of Psalm 35 that changed their whole attitude. They believed for the first time that they could defeat the British in the coming conflict. So he writes his wife, Abigail. He says, Abigail, I must beg you to read that Psalm. Read the 35th Psalm to your friends. Read it to your father. Abigail, you gotta let everybody know what God showed us this morning in Psalm 35. Man, we didn't even know they had prayer, much less a Bible study, much less God spoke to them in Bible study, much less he wanted everybody to know what God showed them in the Bible study. But he didn't stop there. He continued to say, Abigail, he says, we've appointed a continental fast. In other words, they set up a, a, a call for a day of prayer and fasting. He said, millions would be up on their knees at once before their great creator, employing his forgiveness and blessings, his smiles on American council and arms. Abigail, can you imagine what happens when you get three million Americans praying and fasting? And that's what we had back then. But the whole nation's called to pray and fast. And so we had this time of prayer and fasting. That was the first of 15 times that Congress called the people of the United States to prayer. And it alternated between prayer and fasting and prayer and thanksgiving. We would have a time of prayer and fasting like that time. And invariably, a few months later, God's answering prayers like crazy. And so we would have a time of prayer and thanksgiving. And say, you remember all that stuff we prayed and fasted about? Look how God's answered. Let's thank God. And so 15 times we go back and forth between praying and fasting. And wow, look how God answered the prayers. Let's pray and fast. Wow, look how God answered. So 15 times back and forth. We were so much into praying that you will find that by the time you get to 1815, there had been 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer in America. Now you imagine that in the climate we're in today. I mean, you can't even have a kid say God at graduation. 1,400 times the government called us to prayer by 1815? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things we do at Wall Builders. Wall Builders is a name taken out of the Bible book of Nehemiah. It's a grassroots effort where people get involved to rebuild their communities. Well, we really like the, the thing where Josiah discovered that the scrolls in the temple, brought it out and said, wow, I didn't know we used to be like this. When they found their history, it led to a national revival. So at wallbuilders.com, we put these proclamations, we own these proclamations. We put them up where people can see them. It's amazing to see how different we were back then and what we're told today back then was, oh, they were a bunch of atheists, agnostics, theists. They were, it was a secular founding. Well, then what do you do with all this? Well, going back to this first call to prayer, the first prayer and fasting we had, it's interesting that just a few weeks later, there were so many things happening in America that John Adams wrote Abigail and said, Abigail, he said, you're not, you remember that day of prayer and fasting? You're not going to believe what's happening. And so he starts going through all these things that are happening. And he said, you know, Colonel Smith and a group of his men, a bunch of farmers took a British fort and Man, that's like a bunch of rednecks taking on the seals. I mean, that doesn't happen. But here you got a bunch of farmers who took the fort from... He said, we even captured a 64-gun British man-of-war and a 20-gun British man-of-war, which is especially interesting because we didn't have a Navy yet. So we're actually capturing their ships. Well, we kind of did have a Navy. Let me take that back a little bit. If you ever want to see what the American Navy looks like, you go to Washington, D.C., go to the American History Museum, go up on the third floor, and you can see the American Navy. It's called the Gunboat Philadelphia. It essentially is a rowboat with a cannon in each end. That is the American, man, don't you know that scared the British when they saw that coming out? Are you kidding me? 
We capture a 64-gun British man of war and a 20-gun. This is, so all this stuff is happening, and, and they were all talking about it. John Adams was there with some other guys. There. So what did they conclude? Well, I, I mean, seeing all this stuff happen that shouldn't be happening, what did they conclude? He said, Abigail, he said, it appears to me the eternal Son of God is operating powerfully against the British nation. He said, the only way you can explain this is supernatural. God's showing up and God's intervening. There's no other way to explain what's going on with this. So you find this tone being set there. And as you go through the, the American Revolution, you find so many accounts where God showed up. Matter of fact, by the time you get to 1778, George Washington wrote a letter to one of his generals, Thomas Nelson. Thomas, General Thomas Nelson signed the Declaration of Independence, one of the, the founding fathers. And he said, General, he said, what you and I have seen in this revolution, all, all the th we've seen God show up so many times. He said, if people have, could have seen what you and I have seen in fighting this. This is what he said. He said, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more than wicked that hath not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. If you see what we've seen, if you see how many times God shows up, and if you don't feel an obligation to acknowledge God, to thank God, he said, you're not just an infidel, you're wicked. I mean, if, if, you, if your heart doesn't tell you, you need to be thanking God for all you've seen him do, if you don't feel that inclination, you're just flat wicked. That's George Washington talking to one of his generals, said, man, we've seen God show up so many times that if you don't feel like you have an obligation to thank God, you're just, you're, you're, you're pagan. I mean, that's George Washington saying it. By the time you get to 1781, that's the final battle of the American Revolution. In 1781, the British lay down their arms at Yorktown. And now for the first time in 150 years, British policy does not make any difference to America anymore. Now, the reason that's significant is one of the British policies we had lived under was the British said, hey, we have a state established church and whatever the king is, that's what you're all going to be. So if King's Anglican, that's us. If he's Catholic, that's us. And so we were not allowed in America to print Bibles in the English language. The crown would tell us what to use because we have a state established church. But now it doesn't matter. We're not, we're not under that anymore. We, we can do what we want to. We're, we're not under the British law anymore, which is why 1781, Battle of Yorktown, they came forward to the plan to print the first English language Bible in America. It rolled off the presses in 1782. This Bible here is known as the Bible of the Revolution. It's one of the rarest books in the world. There's 10,000 originally printed. There's about eight, eight of them left in private hands today. I have one of those, those originals. This Bible, how did it come about, this first Bible printed in the English language in America? Well, it came about in a fairly interesting way. It came about because Robert Aiken, right here, the official printer to Congress said, hey, let's just print a Bible now. We, we can do this. And so that's what happened. And so you find in the front of the Bible, there is a congressional committee appointed to oversee the printing of the Bible. You have the chaplains of Congress who sign off and said the Bible is, nobody's changed it. It's exactly what God said. And it has this at the bottom. It has an endorsement. It says, Resolve, the United States and Congress assembled to recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. Congress endorsing a Bible? They can't do that? Separation? Wait a minute. They're the guys who gave us separation. I think they know what it means. And they knew that it did not mean secularize the country. It meant don't have a national denomination. Don't say we all have to be Catholics or Anglicans or whatever. There was no thought of taking God out. So here the first Bible printed in English in America in the, and it's in the American Revolution is done with the recommendation of Congress. Now, why would he do that? Because, see, Robert Aiken told Congress if we do this, he said this will be, quote, a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of our schools, end quote. Whoa, so the first Bible printed in English is for the use of schools, and it gets printed, and it has a congressional endorsement in front. By the way, here's the actual handwritten document on it. It says, it's a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of schools. First Bible printed in English in America, congressional endorsement, and it's a Bible for the use of schools. Don't hear that in history today. The very next year, 1783, is when we signed the peace treaty in the American Revolution. Ben Franklin, John Adams, John Jay. Here's that peace treaty. You can actually go to the State Department up on the sixth floor of the John Quincy Adams State Drawing Room. You can see the document that secured American independence, and it's signed right there, John Adams, Ben Franklin, and John Jay. Notice the title on the document. The biggest letters on the whole thing right there. In the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. I could be mistaken, but I think that's Christian. Does that sound Christian to you? Oh no, they're a bunch of atheists, agnostics, and deists. Really? And this is the title of the document that secures American independence? There's not a concept of being a secular nation. 
You see, and that's why John Adams, who was there from start to finish of this thing, I mean, you saw a sign in the documents. John Adams, there from start to finish, said, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. He said, I will now avow that I then believed, and I now believe, that the general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. He said, this is what we did it on. God does not change. His principles do not change. We use Christian principles. It's amazing how much they said and how little we know today of what they said. Because see, what we get is a steady diet of just the opposite. I love collecting articles like this. Uh, this one from the LA Times, America's Unchristian Beginnings. It says, the founding fathers were deists who rejected the divinity of Jesus. Atheists, agnostics, deists. Here's a, a newspaper editorial that ran a whole chain of newspapers out on the, the East Coast. It's called, the authors of the declaration were enemies of Christ. And then, of course, you got to let the professors weigh in. And professors, founding fathers were not Christian. I don't care what John Adams said. He doesn't have a clue what he was talking about. Now, I wasn't there, but I'm telling you. Isn't it amazing that the eyewitnesses there who have one testimony, 200 years later, professors come in and say, no, 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 that's not the way it happened. Well, you weren't there. How do you know? Well, I'm just smart. I've got a PhD. Really? That's the basis. See, you go with eyewitness testimony in a court of law. When you have a trial, you let the eyewitnesses testify. But we don't do that in history anymore today. So you, you look at this and say, really? And a lot of people buy into this because if I put this, and I, I speak at law schools, university schools all the time, I'll always start with this picture of the 56 signers of the Declaration. I put it up, they say, all right, guys, I was Duke University Law School, really smart kids. So who do you recognize? And they got Jefferson and they got Franklin, and that's as far as it went. And that's as far as it goes to all the school. I've been at one school one time in 20 years where one kid came up with the third founding father. One, one time. Everything else is only Jefferson and Franklin. I go, wait a minute. There's 56 of these guys. Well, wh wh why, do, why don't we talk about Richard Henry Lee? Or let's just go beside him to Sam Adams or beside him to George Clinton. Or the guy looking backwards right there is Charles Carroll. The guy in a light brown jacket right there is Robert Morris. Beside him is Benjamin Rush. The guy leaning on his elbow beside him is Elbert Sherry. Right beside him is Robert Tree Payne. And I can go through the other 54 and they say, who? Never heard those names before. Isn't it amazing that we've all been trained to recognize the two least religious founding fathers? We can all find Jefferson and Franklin because they're the least religious guys, and everybody else was just like Jefferson and Franklin. Really? Of the 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence, 29 of these guys graduated from schools that in their day were considered Bible schools or seminaries. Whoa, more than half these guys came through some kind of seminary training program? Yeah. As a matter of fact, go through names that we don't talk about. Let's, let's take this guy right here, John Witherspoon. He's the best known gospel evangelist in his day. He is the Billy Graham of his generation. He has more than a dozen volumes of gospel sermons and he is a very active member of Congress. He was George Washington's boss. He was the president of the Board of War. He served on a hundred committees in Congress. He has tons of writings and when you read his writings you find statements like this. I entreat you in the most earnest manner to believe in Jesus Christ for there is no salvation in any other. Acts 4.12. If you're not reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, if you're not clothed with the spotless robe of his righteousness, you must forever perish. Now, I have to admit, I'm not used to atheists talking like that. I mean, that just kind of strikes me as interesting. Yeah, but who's ever heard of John Witherspoon, see? And the same thing when you go to Benjamin Rush. John Adams said that Benjamin Rush was one of the three most notable founding fathers. He said, you got George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Benjamin Rush. We've never heard of him. Well, why not? Because he's politically incorrect. He doesn't fit any image we try to give today. You see, for one thing, he's, he founded the first abolition society in America, led the national abolition movement, trained the first black physicians, helped start the first black denomination. Well, that it doesn't sound much like a racist, and I thought all the founders were racist. And yeah, that's what we get told, but the same thing. You get the Jefferson and Franklin and nobody else. And then, of course, they're all atheists, agnostics, deists, except for the fact that he founded the first Sunday school movement in America. He founded the first Bible society in America. He started the first faith-based prison reform in America. I just go through all the stuff, and he doesn't fit the image. And so we don't talk about him, even though he's considered one of the three most notable. Every generation before this one knew exactly who he was. You see, Benjamin Rush, really significant. I have so many of his original writings. And when you read his writings, his faith is the first thing that pops out. As he says here, my only hope of salvation is the infinite transcendent love of God manifested to the world by the death of his son upon the cross. Nothing but his blood will wash away my sins. I rely exclusively upon it. Come Lord Jesus, come quickly. 
Again, that sounds kind of evangelical to me. No, nah, he's one of the great atheist founding fathers. See, we just don't know their writings. Same thing when you get to John Hancock. We do know Hancock, but anybody ever hear anything about his faith? Well, interesting thing about his faith is I can take you to what he wrote and what he did. For example, on 22 occasions, he calls his state to days of prayer. Now, this is a day for public fasting, humiliation, and prayer. So what does John Hancock have the state of Massachusetts praying and fasting for? Let me take you to the proclamations he wrote and show you what he had the state of Massachusetts praying and fasting for. Here's one. Let's pray and fast that the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be established in peace and righteousness among all the nations of the earth. Can you imagine what would happen today if any governor had his state praying and fasting for that prayer request? John Hancock did. Here's another one of his prayer requests. Pray that all nations may bow to the scepter of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the whole earth may be filled with his glory. Here's another one of his prayer and fasting requests. Pray and fast and confess our sins before God. Implore his forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Here's another one. Let's pray and fast that the spiritual kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may be continually increasing until the whole earth shall be filled with his glory. That sounds evangelical. No, he's, he's like Franklin and Jefferson. Really? See, the writings, and we post, I've got the proclamations. I posted it online. You can read it yourself, the stuff he wrote. Then you've got folks like Roger Sherman. Roger Sherman is the only founding father to sign all four founding documents, Declaration, Constitutional, Article Association, Articles of Confederation. He's also a framer of the Bill of Rights, First Ten Amendments of the Constitution. He's also the guy who gave us the bicameral system where you have a House and a Senate. And from that, he's the guy who gave us the Electoral College because you see back then with 13 colonies, Four colonies had enough population to outvote the others. So four versus nine, they said, that's not fair. We don't want the four colonies choosing all the people every time for president. We want to have a voice too. So he came up with the electoral college and says, well, you have to have a majority of the people and a majority of the states. See, that's why it's possible to have win the popular vote and not win this because you didn't win enough states. Today, there are three, st in the last presidential election, if you had had 64 million votes cast, you could have won the presidential election. There are three states in the United States today that have 75 million in their state. Those three states can choose the president of the United States every single election, except the Electoral College says, no, you have to have a bunch of states. You have to have the support of the Senate and the House. And that's why the Electoral College is such a brilliant idea. That keeps, that keeps three states from telling the other 47 who the president's gonna be. But see, we don't think about that, that we don't know the history of that. But nonetheless, this guy is a theologian. He wrote the doctrinal creed for his denomination in Connecticut. You read his writings, you find statements like this. He said, God commands all men everywhere to repent. He also commands them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and has assured us that all who do repent and believe shall be saved. He says, God has promised to bestow eternal blessings on all those who are willing to accept him on the terms of the gospel. That is in a way of free grace through the atonement. Man, that sounds orthodox. It ought to. He's a theologian. And by the way, I love what the newspaper said about him in the day. Here's an old newspaper, 1837. It says, Roger Sherman, the volume which he consulted more than any other was the Bible. It was his custom at the commencement of every session of Congress to purchase a copy of the scriptures, to bruise it daily, and to present it to one of his children on his return. So every time he goes to Congress, he has a brand new Bible with him. He opens it up. He writes in the margins what God's shown him in the scriptures. And when he gets home, he gives it to one of the kids. And the kids know it's a keepsake because dad's really famous. At least back then, he's not famous today, but he's famous back then. And by the way, it took him, he had been in Congress a long time to do what he did because he's got 15 kids. So you got to have 15 Bibles. You got to read through it 15 times. Get... Then you got guys like Charles Carroll. <clears throat> Charles Carroll right here. Charles Carroll is the final surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence. He lived to be 95 years old. He's the last one of all the 50s. Now, 95 is not that impressive today. We all know people who live in their 90s, but you need to understand the average lifespan in America back then was 33 years old, which means if you're a high school senior and you're here this morning and you'd been alive back then, you would have already had your midlife crisis. Because when you hit, seven, you hit 17, it's half over for you. You're on the downfall after that point. So he lives to be 95 years old. He outlived his kids. He outlived his grandkids. One of his family members wrote him and said, Charles, you will die someday. <laughs> and when you do die, are you ready to meet God when you die? And he responded with this letter. The question is, are you ready to meet God? He answers it right here. He says, of course I am. He says, he says, on the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for salvation. And on his merits, not on any works I've done in obedience, his precepts. 
Of course I'm ready to meet God. I don't get there because of what I've done. I get there because of what he's done. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace you saved through faith. Now, interestingly, on the 4th of July, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the 4th of July, there were three founding fathers still left alive. You had Thomas Jefferson, you had John Adams, and you had over here Charles Carroll. Those are the three left alive. But on the 4th of July, 1826, I said 25, 1826, on the 50th anniversary, Adams and Jefferson died, leaving him alone. He is now, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration, now the only one of the 56 left alive. So what happens is New York City says, Charles, we have one of the original copies of the Declaration. And I know this doesn't look like what we're used to seeing because we see all the signatures. On the 4th of July, the Declaration of Independence only had two names on it, John Hancock and Charles Thompson. That's it. It was not until the 2nd of August that we did the copy that had all the signatures on it. So, original declaration, 4th of July, it's called the Dunlap Declaration, because he's the guy who printed it, and he said, we got an original copy. Charles, you're the only guy who wrote this that's still left alive. Now, we're 50 years into this thing. We want you to write on this your thoughts 50 years later. What are you thinking 50 years later? And we're going to display this in City Hall in New York City. So, he writes on it. What's he write? This is what Charles, looking back, it's been 50 years since we did this document. What am I thinking now? He says, I'm grateful to Almighty God for the blessings which, through Jesus Christ our Lord, he's conferred on my beloved country. When I look back over the last 50 years, I think, can't thank God enough for what Jesus Christ has done for America. That's not what we hear about these guys. And yet this is what the evidence is that we just didn't get nothing of today. You see, that's why when you get an article like that, the authors of the Declaration are enemies of Christ, how do they get away with saying that? They get away with saying that because we don't know who these guys are anymore. Now, previous generations did. As a matter of fact, we actually have a textbook from 1848 called Lives of the Science. That's a public school textbook used for generations. It had four, five, six pages on every side of the Declaration. We knew them all by name. We knew what they sacrificed. We knew their family. We knew their faith. We knew that nine of these guys never lived to see what they wanted us to have when they signed the Declaration. They didn't even live to the end of the American Revolution. Seventeen of them lost every single thing they owned and, and tried to help keep troops in the field, keep them financed. They, they just went broke being able to do that. Uh, you have five of them that were prisoners of war and three of them that got shot in battle and two of them that lost their wives and kids. Unbelievable, the sacrifices they... But we used to know every one of the 56 because we studied that in school, not today. We get a little bit of Franklin, a little bit of Jefferson, and that's it. And we even used to know the wives. Do you know how many wives of the signers were involved in the revolution? You have Elizabeth Lewis, who was a prisoner of war for resisting the British. I mean, we, we hear nothing about the wives. See, what we get is the American Revolution, a bunch of old white guys. No. There were black founding fathers. There were youth involved. There were Hispanics involved. There were women involved. That, it, it's a huge, cool deal except we just don't get any of that image today. But we used to know, and it's, if you're interested, those books are on the table back there, but that's why we would never have bought what we hear in this generation, previous generations. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you look at John Adams, where we are today, since we're celebrating the 4th of July, two days from now, let me kind of close with a tone for this, because hopefully you've seen some, some information you've never heard before. It's all easily documentable. You can check it out. You can go to our website, wallbuilders.com, see the actual documents and the handwritten letters, etc. On the day that they approved independence from Great Britain, on the day that they separated from Great Britain, John wrote Abigail two letters that day. And the two letters, the first one was like, Abigail, we've done it, we've separated, now we're a free independent nation. So he's really elated. But the second later, letter, later in the day, he says, I've been thinking about what we've done. How are they gonna view this generations from now? Now, I've got to tell you, that's pretty cool. Not many people of us stop, not many of us stop and say, you know what I'm about to do, how are they going to view that 50 years from now? Not many of us look ahead to the future and say, how will my kids and grandkids view this? How will my neighbors, how will, how will other states view this? And that's what he's doing. He's looking, he said, what, what we've just done today, what we've done in declaring independence, what are they going to think about that in future years? And he decided that probably what's going to happen is people are going to look back at that day and say, that's the great anniversary festival. That, this is the day we, this is America's birthday, which is what we're going to do on Tuesday. He said, this is, this is what he told Abigail. He said, Abigail, the, the more I think about this, he said, I, I'm apt to believe that this day will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. He said, when I think about it, I think that 200 years from now, they're going to look at this and say, hey, that's the national birthday. Let's have a big celebration on that day. 
And so he was thinking about that. Is that the right thing to do? Should, should we be doing, should we be celebrating what we did today? And so, you know, and again, I just find it amazing that, that he's looking 200 years down the road. How are they going to think about it 200 years from now? And so in, in looking at it, he says, I think that's probably going to be a, a good thing to celebrate. He, he says, he says, this day ought to be commemorated. We ought to celebrate this. The 4th of July, Let, let's celebrate. He said, this day ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance. This is the day when we broke away from tyranny. We got away from Great Britain. We have our own nation. We now have religious liberty and we now have freedom. We, we have equality. We have stuff we haven't ever had. He said, this day ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. He said, let's have a 4th of July celebration as long as it's a religious celebration. If we're going to celebrate this day, let's do it with solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. Now, that's not the way we keep Fourth of July right now, because that's a secular holiday. We'll watch a, a baseball game, and we'll have a, a cookout, and we'll have fireworks. And he said it ought to be celebrated with squibs and crackers, which is what they use for fireworks. He's, he said, let's have a big celebration as long as it's a religious celebration. Uh, and John Quincy Adams, who was there for the original Fourth of July, John Quincy Adams, President of the United States, said... On the 4th of July, we celebrate those principles that Christ brought in the world and how we applied them to America through the Declaration of Independence. So, my challenge for you is on the 4th of July, two days from now, celebrate it, have fun, but make sure you include solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. Don't let it be a secular holiday. Celebrate it with the original intention. That's supposed to be a religious holiday. Take the time to stop and thank God for, for what he's done, for the blessings. We, just because we don't know what those blessings are, we don't know what our history is, doesn't mean that God hadn't blessed us. He has. If we want the blessings to continue, it helps to know where they came from and what got them here in the first place. And by the way, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, we, we've got what's called the Founder's Bible, where we literally take the Bible verses the Founding Fathers used to create all these things. And again, we get two Founding Fathers, not the others. You look at what the rest of them say, there's so much Bible behind what we do, behind so many things. That there, there are so many black founding fathers and Hispanic founding fathers and, and so many ladies involved and kids involved. I mean, kids, John Quincy Adams, eight years old, has his musket out going with the Massachusetts Minutemen after the British. We just don't even think that way now. It's so cool to see the inculcation of biblical thinking they had in so many areas. So if you're interested in that, that's at the back as well. Let's close in prayer. I know that was a lot of information, but I hope you can hear my heart in presenting that today because when history is forgotten, you don't and can't understand the purpose of many things, which is why many are tearing down monuments in the name of racism and oppression. They have no idea what they actually stand for. When you don't know where you've come from in the past, you will define terms, situations, even people by the perceptions of the present, which many are built on false premises. In our current cultural climate and the events in our day today, I believe are a direct reflection of the failure of the people of our nation to preserve the past by teaching it as it was and teaching the principles we learned that led our nation into the exceptionalism that we enjoy to a degree today. So the failure to keep the principles of the past ensure the eventual failure of the people in the future. And why this is important is because we are engaged right now in a battle for the soul of America, the soul of our nation. America is losing its soul, therefore it's losing its original identity as one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now, as we look at our world, we see that we are many nations under individualism, completely divided, with liberty and justice for those with the loudest voice. It's not what the framers originally intended. Our identity as a nation informs us of what is right and wrong, moral and immoral, acceptable and unacceptable, because we've lost the foundation of our nation or barely holding on to it by a thread. Everyone now is doing what's right in their own eyes instead of living by the guiding principles of the Word of God that brought America its exceptionalism. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 uh, the word of God to the nation of Israel. God is 
declaring this prophecy or declaring this truth over Israel because they had forgotten where they came from. They'd forgotten the Lord and his ways. And now destruction was being brought into the nation. And he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I also rejected thee. Thou shalt not be a priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. They experienced a unique position in the world as being the nation of God, the priests of God, but because they forgot their past, they forgot where they came from, they forgot the covenant of the Lord to pursue what their hearts would lead them to, they began to lose the very blessings they once enjoyed. The same is happening in the church of Jesus Christ with be people who call themselves Christians but are biblically illiterate. A recent LifeWay study found that only 32% of Americans who attend a Protestant church regularly say they read the Bible personally every day. Evangelical Protestants fared a little better, about 36%, but not much. As Albert Moeller put it, the scandal of biblical illiteracy is our problem. Why are people leaving the church and leaving the faith? Why is there more of the world into the church today than there is the church in the world? I believe it's because we have failed to teach our children how to know and how to walk with God. We've allowed the culture to be our children's teacher, to inform us and our kids about what is cool and uncool, what is funny and what is reprehensible. And we've relegated biblical principles and truth, biblical morality, into antiquated and old-fashioned, racist, bigoted ideas. Our kids today hunger for the things of the world more than the things of God in the society. Why? Because really our parents hunger for the things of the world more than they hunger for the things of God. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, Paul prophesying to Timothy about the last days. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there'll be very difficult times. People will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride. They will love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. It's like Paul was reading the daily news in our day today. They act religious, but what they lack is true life-changing faith. There are many religious people in our society and in our world today, but they act religious. They just lack the very life-changing faith. They talk like they're next to God, but they live like the devil. After the resurrection of Jesus, he appears to a couple of his disciples walking down the Emmaus Road. And then when he appears, he disguises himself for a time so he can have a conversation with them. And it's apparent that these disciples are still distraught and worried over the fact that the, their Savior, their Lord, just died. And they're having doubts that he would rise again. In Luke 24, 25 through 27, Jesus kind of rebukes them. And he says, it says, Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus didn't say, Ha-ha, here I am. Here's your proof. No, he took them back to the word of God. From the very beginning and through Scripture, he took them and opened their hearts and their minds to understand, beginning with the Old Testament, the things concerning them himself. Their eyes were opened to see him because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There's a correlation between the Old and New Testaments. Without the foundation of the Old, we can't have or understand the New. The Old Testament tells us about what should be in the New. And many believers today, many followers of Christ, don't even look at the Old Testament. They don't even read the Old Testament. Many don't even know how to find Jesus in the Old Testament, which is why we're going through the Scriptures in this story, The Great Romance. And therefore, the history, that is his story, has been lost to this generation. The depth of what God did to bring out salvation to the world has been lost on these current generations. And so our appreciation level for everything God has done and our level of awe and wonder for the Lord and his salvation 
just the story of the founding of this nation alone, what God did to bring this nation into being should fill us with awe and wonder. But our level of awe and wonder for the Lord and His salvation is really matched by our level of knowledge and understanding of who He is and what He's done. Our hunger for spiritual knowledge and understanding is swallowed up by our hunger for entertainment and acceptance in the world. We'll watch hours and hours of television that glorifies ungodly men, ungodly principles, and immorality, and we won't spend one hour reading the Bible and connecting to God in prayer. And now we're in an election season. But this is not the only election that matters. I believe every election where we vote people into an office that will not only represent us in government, but determine the laws that will guide our culture is vitally important for the state of our union and the soul of America. And this is not a Democrat and Republic thing. This is a Christian thing. This is a believer thing. This is a soul of America thing. In this world today, where there are multiple parties, but really, as it boils down to, we have a two-party system. There's one party that promotes the separation of church and state as if it means no faith allowed to influence or be allowed in the public square. There is one party who's trying to silence the voice of the other. There's one party who's trying to abolish the nuclear family and redefine what it means to be a man or a woman. There is one party who's promoting hate and division. There is one party who's promoting the acceptance of immoral behavior. There is one party who's promoting the advancing issues of infanticide under the disguise of women's right to choose. There is one party who stands against telling the truth about our history, promoting the love for country and pride in our heritage and demanding people kneel for the national anthem. There is one party overlooking the riots in major cities while telling churches they can't meet or if they do, they can't sing. There is one party who's leading the immorality of America, but the other party's not even standing up against them and doing anything about it. It's not a Democrat-Republic thing. It's a spiritual warfare thing. So why as believers do we tolerate people who are killing the soul of America, trying to fundamentally transform America, which has come out of the lips of politicians? Trying to transform us from what made us exceptional into what has never worked in recorded history in any part of the world. Unless you find success in wealth and power for the few while poverty and oppression reigns over the masses. Why are we not protesting activist judges trying to legislate from the bench when it's the Congress that writes the laws? Why do we tolerate people who are killing the soul of America? Why are we voting for candidates who stand against biblical moral values and everything we hold sacred in Scripture and as a nation I believe, one, it's because we don't know the Scriptures. We don't know the Word of God. We don't understand the purposes to why God leads us and instructs us to live a certain way in life. And two, our really, our allegiance is not first to Jesus. It's to man-made constructs that we find that make us feel comfortable in this world. Man-made constructs and ideals that ultimately are dominated by the ruler of this world. When the Scripture says, come out from among them, says the Lord. Be not conformed to the manners and behaviors and customs of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because of our lack of knowledge as the people of God, we as a nation are now following the way of Israel. You look at their history. Once they began to turn away from God, they began to erect idols and to the point that they set up false gods in the very holy place next to the temple, in the temple. What once was an abomination became commonplace. And it led them from a place of blessing to a place of destruction because rather than leading the culture into godliness, they insulated themselves, got spiritually lazy. And the same is true for the church. Rather than leading the culture, being the prominent and loud voice in the culture, we have insulated ourselves, created a subculture. We've gotten spiritually lazy and we've let more of the world into the church than taken the church into the world. And now we look around and ask, oh my gosh, what's happened? Within 300 years, I believe God's call for the church is that more believers need to quit complaining and they need to start campaigning. We need to quit complaining about what we read in the news. We need to start campaigning. There's some of you, you're retired. You've got time. Run for office. Do something. 
There are some of you that, that you're questioning about to continue in your job. There's plenty of places in society that need a godly voice, that need the Spirit of God and the kingdom of God to come into the world. I was really, you know, proud. We, the last uh, weekend or so, we did a, a uh, garage sale in our house, and, and it was kind of like a community garage sale. We were doing one, and all of a sudden, like three or four households were joining us. It was kind of crazy. But I was proud of my mother-in-law because she had a petition that she was uh, promoting to repeal the 1845 law that's given the governor the sole discretion to basically lock down our nation and really pick and choose which, which businesses succeed and which ones fail. And, and I was proud that she was at least taking an action. There are many ways to get involved that don't require full devotion to a campaign. But believers need to stop being silent, and we need to raise up and use the voice God has given us. I believe God is ready to bring revival to this nation, but it begins with us. It begins with us getting the fire of the Holy Spirit, the fire of true calls for justice, true calls for liberty, freedom. The principles and ideals that led to our nation's founding need to once again come and be preached at the pulpits and be led into the streets by the followers of Christ. Or else we're going to see a nation turned upside down and we're going to lose the very thing we hold dear. Second Chronicles 7.14 is the last scripture I'll leave you with today. There was a promise made to Israel that when they found their nation in a state of disrepair, destruction, ungodliness, they found that they were led out of the promised land. All the blessings of God were removed because of immorality or turning their backs on the Lord. In Second Chronicles 7.14 God says, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and restore their land. And I believe the call to every one of us today is to call on the name of the Lord, to begin to seek his face for our nation. This is why prayer is so important. One of our core values is unceasing prayer. If we're not praying, our heart's not connected. We need to be praying for our nation. But more than just prayer, it says, seek my face. This is a proactive action. It's to turn from the way you've been going and turn and to begin doing something else. This is the, the nature of repentance. And I believe as believers, we need to stop and we need to repent of our apathy and this ho-hum mentality of, oh, we're just going to accept things as they are. We need to say, no, enough is enough. We're not standing for immorality any longer. We're not standing for abortion any longer. It's murder. It's wrong in every circumstance. That immorality, God instituted a way of the world. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Science and facts don't care about your feelings. You are what you were created to be. Now there's an element of compassion we need to have, but the voice that is unraveling the nation and the world is a voice that's leading us away from the very heart of what God created when he founded this nation. We love people, but we stand against what is going to destroy us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. We don't protest people because our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against the principality and powers of this world. But at some point, we have to stop being inactive, and we have to be proactive. You can't win your neighbor with the gospel if you don't go over and talk to him. There takes an action that needs to take place. And I believe that now is the time. We're at this critical juncture. These events in our world are vital, and the church needs to arise and take its place. Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes in just a moment. I'm going to ask my wife to come up and play that last song we just sang. And in light of everything going on, in light of our nation, as we look at what happened in Israel with Egypt, how there arose a time when the Pharaoh didn't recognize Joseph, I believe we're in a day where a time has arisen where our leaders don't recognize our founding fathers. They don't recognize they don't understand. They don't know. And just as they proclaimed and called the nation into prayer and fasting, I want to call us today to prayer for our nation. A time of intercession. And that, that prayer first begins with, God, change my heart 
and show me the way I need to go. Show me how I need to get involved. Show me what I need to do. It's not anyone else's responsibility. I'm not too old. I'm not too young. Show me what I need to do. As the music begins to play, if you want to come forward and kneel down the altar that's open, if you want to get with the people you're around and just intercede for our nation, every level from our government to our judicial system to our media, arts and entertainment, our education, I believe our education systems need a revival. They need a return to the truth. They need to teach people our history, where we come from. We don't know who we are anymore. But we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for revival. And just as our founding fathers beckoned the people to pray, we need to pray that the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ expands, not just here in this place, but around the world. So let's go to prayer. Lord, we pray for our nation. God, as your people, we are coming humbly because we know that you and you alone have the power to turn the tide in this war for the soul of America. And just as Israel thought the situation was impossible, their prospects of leaving slavery in Egypt, Lord, we look at the world and we see how much power the enemy has in every area of influence. And sometimes we look at that and think it's hopeless, God, but the same God who made a way through the Red Sea is the same God who can deliver this nation once again. So God, we pray for a return, a return to our founding principles, a return to honor and respect for this nation that you've given us, a return to the ideals and the, just the respect and honor for this great country. Lord, we recognize this country has not been perfect, but God, it is a nation that you've given that you have blessed greatly. Even the poorest among us are among the richest in the world. So God, we pray that you would position leaders. Your word says that you put every leader into its place and to exercise your will. God, give us leaders who will stand for truth and justice and liberty and righteousness and holiness that will not be afraid to call us back to our beginning. God, raise up leaders in the church who have bold faith, who will speak the truth and declare what is necessary to lead the people you've given them to fight the good fight and finish the race to not get spiritually apathetic or lazy and not give ground to the enemy due to inaction. It's not enough to post on Facebook or social media, God. 
We need people to take their place. We need people to run for office. We need spirit-filled believers to go to law school and go into the court systems. We need spirit-filled believers to rise up into education and help write the history books and tell the truth about where we've come from. We need people to rise up into upper levels of education and bring revival to these institutions that are anti-God and anti-America. God, this nation is the, one of the only nations in the world that you're using to partner with your nation, Israel, to gu- give it protection and, and to give it blessing, God. And if this nation goes, so does that relationship. So God, for your nation, your people, Israel's sake, God, bring us revival. We pray for the peace of Israel. We pray for a continued relationship to be strengthened between our nations so that your purposes can be done and your glory can go throughout the earth. God, we thank you for who you are and what you're doing in this place. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to move and work. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you have a need for prayer, then we just invite you to come forward and our prayer team will be here to pray with you. If you have a testimony that you want to share, something God has done to encourage the church, we encourage you to come forward. We have the microphone down front you can share. But as Tony leads us in the song, I encourage you to sing along and worship. In just a minute, we will have the Lord's Supper and we'll be dismissed.
God, we look to you. You won't be overwhelmed. Give us vision to see things like you do. Oh God, we look to you. You wear our help come strong. Give us wisdom. You know just what to do. This time, if you so desire, we invite you to come forward, get some bread for the communion, and uh, I'll encourage you to get the elements, and then on your way out to just spend some time in prayer, thanking God for the sacrifice of His Son, and celebrating that together, and after you receive the elements, you'll be dismissed.
going to pray. And then after the prayer, you're welcome to take of the elements and we'll be dismissed. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that the blood that you shed on the cross was for all sin. And there's not a person here, God, that doesn't fall short of your glorious standard. So the sacrifice you gave was once and for all. Your grace is amazing. Your love never fails. And though, God, your heart breaks for injustice, your heart breaks for sin, what's unmatched is your amazing love and grace. That you seek to show mercy rather than judgment. And it's by your sacrifice, God, we are cleansed, we are healed, and we are saved. That every decision we've made in the past can be made right, be overturned. That our sins can be washed away. We can be cleansed white as snow. It's by the blood that you shed, God, that we can be made right with you and enter into that new covenant where we who are far away can be brought in as sons and daughters of the Most High God. We thank you, Lord, for everything you are, everything you've done. We thank you, God, that you've not given up on our nation. We thank you, God, that you're empowering your church through love and truth to stand as bright and shining symbols of faith. A light to guide the way, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. God, let us remember that we are not against people. We are against the power that is behind the culture. So let us not forget to love and to do good works. Let us not forget our faith and the promises of God. And I just pray, God, you'd send us out now with a fervor and a fire especially as we see every election come up, God, that we wouldn't be uninterested, but we'd get interested. God, that we would take sole responsibility for our nation upon ourselves, to educate ourselves, and to lead this nation in a way that will continue to honor your name, but also enable everyone to the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. God, we thank you for everything you've done thus far, and we continue to believe you for the best days yet to come. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Maybe eat, and when you're finished, you're dismissed.